Hello and welcome back to another video. This is video three in my Narcissism in the Workplace series. In this video, we're looking at the Duluth Power and Control Model. We're looking at why it can be hard to spot a narcissist. The age-old question of can a narcissist change? And I'm going to offer some advice and support both for individuals and for organisations on managing narcissistic abuse and bullying in the workplace. I'm Jo Banks. I am a professional executive coach and have been for almost 15 years and I'm sharing what I know. So as I've done in the previous videos, just a little bit of a quick overview before I launch into the content of today's video. So looking back at what we've covered in the previous two videos, and I will leave the links for those below. In the first video, we looked at the things that drive a narcissist. So what's underneath their behavior, and it's not what you think it might be. So if you haven't seen that video, you might want to go and have a look at that. We also look at the common traits, not necessarily the ones that are used for diagnosis, but the ones that we see really, really commonly in everyday behaviours of a narcissist. And I also discuss victims. Who are their victims? So again, link for that will be below. In video two, we talked about the narcissistic abuse cycle. So that is love bombing, devaluation, discard, and Hoover. I go through each stage of that and also the red flags to look out for. So again, if you haven't seen it, you might want to make sure you check that one out. In this video, today's video, I'm going to go over the Duluth Power and Control Model. I have gone through this previously in another video, but I definitely think it's worth revisiting. I'm also going to answer the question, why narcissism can be hard to spot? The age-old question, of can a narcissist change? I'm going to give some advice for organisations and also some advice for victims. So that's what we're covering off today. I do have one more video to do on this topic and that's a Q&A where I'm going to use a lot of the questions. I got so many questions from when I delivered this session to hundreds of HR people last year. I did a series of these for HR people. So I'm going to use some of the questions that were brought up in those sessions because I'm sure you will find them useful too. So that will be the last video. So if you haven't subscribed yet or hit that notification bell, please make sure that you do that so that you don't miss that final video when it's out. Okay, let's just do a little bit of the admin bit. Trigger warning for people who maybe have been or going are going through narcissistic abuse. Please be careful. This is not meant as a replacement for for professional psychological or medical support or advice. This session will focus on basic awareness, not meant as a diagnostic tool. Please take responsibility for your own well-being. Seek professional support if you need it. Uh, the tools and techniques you use at your own risk. So let's get into the detail of today's session, starting first with the Duluth Power and Control Model. So let's take a quick look at this model. It's a really important one and one that I will definitely talk about in more detail in another video. In the first section, we've got using intimidation, making workers feel uncomfortable or afraid by using looks, actions, gestures, smashing things, destroying property. I've actually witnessed bosses throwing things at their subordinates, which is just absolutely incredible and complete abuse. Using emotional abuse, putting workers down, making them feel bad about themselves, name calling, making them think that they're crazy, playing mind games, humiliating, using guilt. Again, this is a gaslighting tactic. Next, we have using isolation, controlling what workers do, who they can talk to, what they can read, where they go, limiting outside involvement. Next, we have minimising, denying and blaming, making light of abuse and not taking concerns about it seriously enough. 
denying that the abuse happened, shifting responsibility onto the worker and blaming the worker for abuse. Again, gaslighting. Using co-workers, making co-workers feel guilty about the work levels of other workers, using co-workers to relay messages from the employer, threatening to terminate co-workers if tasks aren't done. Next, we have using employer privilege, treating workers like servants, making decisions without proper input, acting like an authoritarian. Next section, we have using economic abuse, threatening to terminate workers and or reduce pay, threatening to ruin a worker's reputation in the sector. Finally, we have using coercion and threats, making and or carrying out threats to hurt the worker or making things exceptionally difficult for them, threatening to shut down the facility, forcing workers to engage in illegal or unsafe work. Taking a look now at support and advice. Why it can be difficult to spot narcissism, especially in the workplace. Well, narcissism and bullying can be covert. We discussed that in the first video in this series. Not all narcissists are really out there with their bullying. Some are because they use triangulation, as we discussed in the last video. They use other people against you. And so that kind of bullying can be really overt. However, sometimes it can be really under the radar. Some narcissists, most narcissists are really clever. They don't want to get caught. They don't want other people to think badly of them and they choose their victims carefully. And so it can be very, as I say, under the radar. And just because someone doesn't seem like a bully does not mean that they aren't. As I say, they can be very charismatic. They can be very amazing to one person and be very cruel and bullying to another. They're the same person. They just don't let everybody see who they really are. Narcissists choose their victims. And again, I discussed that in video one. So if you've missed that, you might want to go back and have a look at that. I did discuss who are the victims of narcissists. So they can be very calculated. As I say, they don't display the same behaviours to everybody. It can be very covert. You also can't imagine that people could be so callous. I was working with a company not so long ago and they brought me in because there was some real, really bad bullying going on. And when I actually raised with their HR team, I think you might have a narcissist on your hands here. They... A couple of people just laughed because they just thought, oh, well, you know, only serial killers are narcissists. Oh, no, no, no. If you've watched all of this series, you will know that it is a personality trait, but it's difficult to understand and come to terms with if you've never come across that type of personality before. So you just can't imagine that people could be so blatantly mean and cruel to other people or even covertly mean and cruel, especially if you haven't seen it yourself. And in society, we often victim blame. We often blame the victim. We don't necessarily look at the perpetrator. We blame the victim. Looking now at can you change a narcissist? Well, yeah, no, you absolutely can't. And you know what? They're not really up for changing either. You do occasionally hear of narcissists going to therapists. I have a couple of friends who are therapists and they now know basically because of the training that I've given them because it's not necessarily something that we know about is that they can really spot a narcissist. Now, a narcissist will only go to therapy if it serves them. If they think they can they can manipulate the therapist and get the therapist on their side so that it validates them and their behaviour. So... Yeah, narcissists can't change, but you can change the environment. Narcissism and bullying thrive in toxic work environments. They thrive where people turn a blind eye. So if you see bullying in your workplace and you do nothing about it, that makes you complicit. 
Now, I know this is really tricky. As I say, I have delivered this session to hundreds and hundreds of um, HR professionals and it was such a big thing. That's why I ran a few of these sessions because there were so many people wanted to come on it and learn about narcissism. It can be really complex, but it's really important to know about and it's important to know the traits. It's important to know that it hides in plain sight and that it is a thing. So it thrives so people turn a blind eye. We can't just let this go. Looking now at advice for individuals. There's a term we use in narcissistic recovery and it's called going grey rock. Now, the biggest thing that we do say, if you can do it, is to go completely no contact. So that is to block them from your phone, to block them from your emails, to block them from every aspect of your life, if at all possible. Now, that's not necessarily possible when you're in a work environment. The next best thing, either if you're having to parent, co-parent with a narcissist, and I know we're not really talking about per, uh, personal relationships, but I know some of you watching this will be resonating with this now, or you have to deal with them from a work-based capacity, either they're your boss or they're your a colleague, they're your colleague, is to go what we call grey rock. So think of a grey rock. It's completely inanimate. It doesn't move. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. It doesn't answer back. It doesn't try and get back at that other person. It doesn't try and get one over on the other person. It just sits there. It gives no reaction because one of the biggest things that a narcissist wants is your reaction. That's where they get their narcissistic supply, their narcissistic fuel from. They get it from knowing that they're getting to you. That is like air to them. I know it just sounds incredible, doesn't it? But it's true. So going grey rock. And when I say go grey rock, that just means you just be factual in your interactions. You don't give more than you need to. You certainly do not go over and above in any way, shape or form. You just stay factual. You stay polite and you do nothing more. You set boundaries, clear boundaries. It is never too late to set boundaries, set boundaries around the things that you will discuss, the time that you will spend, the things that you will allow yourself to do for that person, but only in the course of your duties. So setting boundaries, it's never too late. One thing that I say, and I don't know if I've explained, but I was in human resources for 20 years before I established my coaching business 15 years ago. So I had 20 years experience of being in HR. And one thing that I would always say to people who think they're being bullied is keep diary notes. Keep diary notes of every single interaction you have with that person, whether it's a toxic one or not. Keep notes, keep texts, keep emails, keep notes of telephone conversations, keep everything. Because if at some point you want to take this formal or make it formal, in the UK we have a grievance procedure you're going to need evidence. Without that, your HR or your people department is going to say, sorry, nothing we can do. So evidence is your friend. Keep notes of everything. Keep an evidence file. So important. I would also suggest that you don't keep that on your work computer because if something happens and these things do sometimes, you want that evidence somewhere else. You don't want somebody in work, if it's your boss or your colleague, to somehow get access to that and wipe it or do something nefarious with it. So move it somewhere else outside of work. I know that can sometimes be an issue with data protection, but I'm sure you can find ways to work through that. Tell someone, oh my goodness, please tell someone, tell HR, tell somebody who is more superior to the person that is bullying you. That's one of the regrets that I have about my bullying experience. And I talk a lot about that when I talk about, I think it's the three learning points I got from my bullying in work. Again, I'll leave the link below. One of the biggest things I wish I'd done was to tell somebody. And I, I didn't, I just didn't. In the end, I resigned um, after, yeah, a, a, a lot of abuse. And one of the things that I wish I'd done is to tell somebody. Educate yourself and others. I, again, I've said this in previous videos, I've got a fact sheet on this. I will leave the link below um, so you can go to my website and you can download a fact sheet which goes through the main topics that I've covered 
within this series. Again, go back and look at the other videos as well if you haven't seen those. And I am going to be doing one on a Q&A, the Q&As that I got from the HR directors and the HR people who came on my training a year ago. So that's an upcoming video. So hit the notification, subscribe and hit the notification bell for that. Get some support. Oh my goodness. So important that you get some support to help yourself through this. You can't do it on your own. It's too hard. Get yourself a coach, a therapist, somebody who is trauma informed and knows about narcissism. You would be surprised how few people do. Um, really important that you get somebody who really understands what's what's happening and, and what you're going through. We all have choices. We don't have to stay. One of the things that I do say with people is to get out sooner rather than later. It's it's so important for your own mental health. I stayed too long and it really, really affected me for a long time afterwards. I wish I'd got out sooner. Now, when I talked about this in the session that I did with the HR professionals, some people were really angry about this. You should raise a grievance. You should do all of these things. But you know what? For some people, if you know it's not going to make any difference, sometimes the person who's bullying you is more valuable to the organisation than you are and they aren't going to let that person go. They're not going to do anything. They'll brush it under the carpet. Sadly, that's a true fact. You need to get out sooner rather than later. The longer you stay, the worse your confidence will get and you'll find it more and more difficult to get another job because you will just feel so demoralised. You, As I say, your self-confidence and your self-esteem will be eroded. Don't ever let it get to that point. Life is too short and you are worth far more than that. Far more than that. No person is worth making yourself physically or mentally ill for. Get out sooner rather than later. Here's some quick advice for organisations. Have a robust anti-bullying anti policy. Take a zero tolerance approach. Have a whistle blowing procedure in place. Focus on patterns of behaviour rather than the person. Just because you think the person is amazing and wonderful, they've probably got a manipulation type reason for being nice to you, but maybe not so for the person they're bullying. So focus on patterns. You now know the abuse cycle. So focus on that rather than the person. Create a safe place for people to talk and listen to them. Validate them. Don't just dismiss them. Train your staff on bullying. I have a full course on bullying in the workplace and it includes narcissism. So please get in touch with me for my corporate training on that. Not an issue, joe at joebanks.net. Additional training for mental health first aiders is always a good thing so that they can spot it as well. So even this training that I've gone through today would be really beneficial for mental first aiders. Provide coaching or therapy to your staff who are maybe going through it. It's one of the things that a lot of, of my corporate clients get in touch with me with is helping people who've been through bullying. However, I would say that if you are going to use a provider, they must be trauma informed because they can make things a whole lot worse if they don't know about trauma and they don't know about narcissism. So that's really important. Again, I'm a coach. I do this for a living. So feel free to get in touch with me if that would be of any benefit. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the main content. Let's do a little bit of an overview here of what we've covered, a bit of a summary of what I've covered in, in these last three videos. Narcissism is a real thing. It isn't just something that's related to serial killers and all of that nonsense we watch on Netflix. It's a real thing. Research suggests that it's on the increase. Bullying thrives where people turn a blind eye. We all have choices about where we work. So if you are being bullied and intimidated and you raise it with somebody and nothing happens, you might really want to think about moving because I know I don't want to stay where I'm not wanted. And again, you know, you might have that idea of, well, why should I leave? Well, if you can stick it out and it's not going to erode your self-confidence and your self-esteem, fine. 
If you're happy, if you can deal with it, great. But if you can't, get out sooner rather than later. No job is worth risking your mental or physical health for. Additional resources. This is just some information that I know has really helped me with my research and what I've been going through. It's stuff that I often share with my clients as well. So I've got lots of information on my blog at joebanks.net forward slash blog. I've got lots of articles on narcissism there. Dr. Romani Devasala, oh my goodness, she is just a legend. She is all over YouTube. She's got a brilliant Instagram channel. She's got a fabulous podcast. I, it's out every Thursday. I don't miss a one. And she's got the most amazing books. Also, recommended reading. I'm sorry, I think my picture is on top of that there. But Psychopath 3 is a great book. In Sheep's Clothing is amazing. And Boundaries, that's another good book. So, They're the additional resources that I really do recommend if you want more information on this that you go away and have a look at. So that brings us to the end of the three, the three main videos in this series. The wrap up. I hope that this video really helps you better understand coercive control in the workplace. I often find that when people see an accepted model, they're much more likely to accept that narcissism is a thing, as is coercive control. As I mentioned in this video, narcissists can be hard to spot because they're often experts at mimicking. They choose their victims carefully, they're highly manipulative, and no, narcissists can't or rather won't change. However, you can. If you're experiencing narcissistic bullying or any kind of bullying, here's one thing that might be worth remembering. All narcissists are bullies, but not all bullies are narcissists. If you can't remove that bullying or narcissistic person from your life entirely by going what we call no contact, that's completely stopping any access to you whatsoever, which can be hard to do if you're working with the person, obviously, then using the grey rock technique is by far the best way of dealing with them. What next? If you haven't seen the previous two videos in this series, I'll leave one of the links at the end and I'll leave both links below. In the first video, I cover what drives the narcissist, traits of a narcissist and who are their victims. In the second video, I discuss the narcissistic cycle of abuse. In the next video, I'll be answering some of the questions raised when I delivered this training to hundreds of HR people. Also, one quick reminder that I do have a fact sheet, Narcissism in the Workplace, and again, I'll leave the link below. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. It's completely free, helps me get this free information in front of more people. And please remember to hit that notification bell so that you don't miss the final video in this mini-series. Finally, thank you so much for your continued support. Thank you to everybody who stays until the very end and enjoy the rest of your day. 